So I'm going to stop asking a few questions. And um, if the question is, um, there's a big digital skills gap, these guys has even need to employ more people literate in computing and coding. If that's the question and there aren't enough of them, was the answer, is the answer um, the computing reforms brought in by Marco Goben et al? Navita. So I think Mary has already mentioned that the uh, computing curriculum has certainly been a step forward. There's no doubt about that. Those of you that are familiar with the computing national curriculum may know that it actually has three strands, which are computer science, um, IT and digital literacy. Um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that computer science um, is at GCSE, at A-level, the qualifications have been reformed, they've been made more rigorous, um, and yes, definitely that is the, the right step forward. However, um, I believe, um, and I, many of my colleagues believe, that the gap has now been created for, for an IT and digital literacy qualification that existed before and needed to be reformed and made more vigorous, but instead the government has decided to scrap it. And therefore, all we've been replaced with is a computer science qualification that focuses on computational thinking and programming. However, you don't have the balance of the creativity and the other digital skills that are also needed to fulfill the need that is there out there in industry, which is not just programming. And, and, I, and I think that that's, that's what's missing at the moment. Mary, is that something you agree with? Yeah, I completely agree with everything Navita said there. And um, I think we might um, add to that. Um, I mean, we were both involved in developing a specification or an outline specification for IT A level and um, IT GCSE, and we did find that there was plenty of scope for not overlapping too much with the computer science curriculum, and yet the government scrapped it, scrapped the IT that is, which also meant that we've had to scrap one of our initial education um, training courses, in that we had a computer science. Um, PGCE program for teachers who are going to teach uh, computing up to GCSE level and then A level computer science. And then we had a computer science and IT for people who were coming out of industry mostly and wanted to teach IT at A level. Now they still have the opportunity, there are vocational courses, but this is not going to encourage a, a full range of students um, to get a good understanding of aspects of computing. Um, and so I think that is one thing that we should look again at. Um, I think there are other things that we are getting right, um, and this fits in with what's happening in the rest of the world, um, and that is that the our curriculum starts quite young. Some would say it starts too young because we're starting at five years old, and some countries have decided to go for seven years old uh, because um, there's been some research, particularly in New Zealand, that's finding that if you start students off too young, trying to grasp some of the ideas like computational thinking, then it actually detracts from their understanding of English and maths and so on. Now, I'm not quite convinced about that because I think a lot of it is, is down to the pedagogy. And so one of the things we need to look at is the pedagogy, particularly for younger students. Do you guys as employers of this sort of talent conveyor belt, do you feel that um, the reform to computing science was the right one? and or do you worry that talent still isn't coming through? And would the IT qualification we were talking about be the right answer? Uh, on behalf of the whole games industry, you're asking me to speak. Um, I think it's interesting. It's I, I, I don't know how many of you caught a recent BBC uh, article which had a survey about um, approaches to teaching in schools, whether people preferred a school to teach the academic basics and discipline or if they preferred schools to teach creativity. And in Europe, um, the responses they had from Europe were that the majority of survey respondees said they preferred the school to teach creativity to young people. And in the UK, we were the reverse. So more people wanted the school to teach academic basics and discipline. And I think that's a cultural thing within the UK. So I would come at it from a, a much wider thing of challenging what we perceive games or computing to be and there's maybe a, a stigma attached to it in a way that we need to work on so when we talk about games when we talk about computing science we don't want people to think of games as this old school traditional someone in no room alone games can be so much more and when we talk about games we talk about learning by playing games and learning by 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 failure is what is what games development is 
And I think that's what we need to teach more in schools, about how learning can be playful, it can be inspiring cur curiosity. Um, it doesn't have to be a, um, a kind of a, a, a dry subject. So I'm, I'm trying to branch out into this and not be a uh, yes or no type <laughs> thing. I'm trying to and, and kind of, I guess, ask, are we, do we have a stigma attached to games or computer science that you feel you find when you're talking to students or parents? Monica, I mean, this is a broad ranging question now. I mean, do we teach in the right way? Uh, I'd like to respond in a different way, which is actually to look at it from industry's perspective. Um, because I think, you know, the curriculum reforms are part of it, but this is a bit of a, a push-pull situation. And in order to know whether we've got it right, we need to look at the needs of business and the economy and what shape and form of skills are needed and, and what is it that's actually going to entice young people into a career in digital or gaming. Um, very often, you know, kids will um, have that creative streak but they may not be sufficiently stimulated to know what they want to do with it. And that's where the means and the method of teaching comes in. If you can tap into those creative needs um, and channel them through a whole range of different teaching um, methods and application, then that's going to be a big help. Um, but there's also something about, you know, the question about whether we start kids young enough um, or too young. Um, there aren't many three-year-olds around now that don't know how to operate an iPhone or an iPad and can find their way around um, um, IT uh, a lot quicker than parents or teachers. So there is something about the curriculum, but there's also something about the social and home environment in which kids are, are raised that we need to channel and to make sure that they are actually getting the right stimulation and we spot that and harness it and so the dialogue between industry and what is needed and schools in order to shape the delivery of teaching is, is absolutely crucial. Where does Sega stand on this, Peter? Um, it's, it's such a, a broad subject, right? Because there's so many different um, uh, areas of, of coding. Like Obviously, games development is, is huge. Um, there's many different um, um, areas of expertise required to be a specific kind of games programmer, whether it's a UX programmer, whether it's, I don't know, like a battle designer or a 3D artist. Um, and then the, the skills we need in, on, even on the publishing side, like um, data analysis, um, all the different IT skills, network security, I feel a little bit overwhelmed as to how you even start delivering all those, I mean, you, I guess you engage kids at a young age and start teaching them broadly um, and, and teaching them soft skills. And then as they go through the educational system, they start learning more um, hard technical skills. I mean, I don't know when, when you start doing that or, or even how you start doing that. I guess you guys would know where to do that. Do you want to explain a little bit about how you start, how you bring it into the curriculum, Mary? Okay, so um, at five years old, what they can do is have a little robot so that they can drive around the, the floor. Um, and that's obviously starting to develop some ideas about sequencing. So um, that's why I think that you can actually start children off very, very young. I think um, what most people are saying about how we should develop the curriculum is that it should go in a sort of spiral where you're developing um, understanding and skills alongside each other. And actually, that is one of the key things that I think we really ought to be rethinking slightly about this so-called digital skills agenda. I don't think it's just about skills. I think it's about how do we actually, yes, develop the practical skills, but also think about what understanding you need in order to have particularly the higher level skills. Because we don't want to go back to just the basic skills that we had a few years back. I mean, I don't think the digital skills agenda is just about basic skills but it's not talking enough about understanding and we know that if people are going to be able to do things and then to use the skills they develop in one particular area and hopefully transfer those skills into another area or topic then they need to develop understanding of um, what they're doing why they're doing it why they're using the particular tools that they're using and the kinds of processes that they're using and that may be where some of our ideas about computational thinking come through. Just another big area which we could 
discuss, but perhaps we'll leave it for the moment. <laughs> so yes, so you've got this gradual development, um, developing practical skills, starting to learn bits of programming, and then um, as you go through um, up into the higher parts of primary school, you've got lots of um, new tools and facilities available. I mean, Scratch is a wonderful programming language, language for primary schools. And then as we go up into secondary school, we then need to transfer from, from the visual languages to the more um, written languages, which is um, another difficult thing. Um, we've been talking about programming and coding quite a lot. We shouldn't forget that it's not just about programming and coding. And actually, programming is a better thing to talk about than coding, because programming involves problem solving. And that is um, really useful and important. And hopefully, some of these problems can be creative problems that you're solving. Um, I don't know whether, Navita, you want to talk a bit about creativity. Because I think one of the reasons we might be losing some of this creativity is because of the way the courses are organized. And that shouldn't be necessary. It should be possible to have courses that are creative. After Navita has spoken, I'm going to ask you guys to put your hands up and ask a couple of questions. But Navita, creativity on the courses. Um, when students come to us at Key Stage 3, we also we, we have the flexibility to be able to offer them um, a range of different project work that can be really creative, can allow them to work together in teams and try and mimic the way the industry produces solutions to different problems. Unfortunately, the GCSE specifications don't allow that, especially the new ones, which are very controlled. 20% um, is the practical project, the practical programming project uh, for the new um, uh, computer science GCSE. Um, it's completely and utterly controlled. They're not allowed to speak to anyone. They're not allowed to use the internet. Um, there's no teamwork whatsoever. They're not allowed to discuss the solution at all. And it doesn't seem to allow for any creativity whatsoever. The tasks are completely set by the examining board. And therefore, there's going to be a few solutions that you could come up with. But they're not really allowing for that creativity to be harnessed at all. Um, and therefore, it may actually be working against what we're trying to do. Because it may well be putting some of these students off the subject, thinking, if this is what this is what it's about, if this is what I have to do as a, as a programmer, um, do I really want to be pursuing this kind of um, industry? Do I really want to be uh, pursuing this kind of career? So it does make, it, make our jobs harder in trying to inspire students to continue computer science at A-level, where the, the experience at GCSE may not well have been what they would have wanted it to be, especially particularly for girls who um, benefit even more from working in teams and being able to problem solve together and, and having that creative aspect. Just to um, comment as a parent of a 16 year old who has just done his GCSEs, um, um, my son, I mean, he built his first PC at, at the age of 10. Um, he does stuff that I can't even imagine in terms of both the, the practical and the technical um, and excelled at computing all the way through school. He's just done his GCSE in computing and he's given it up. So he's not taking it on to A level because he felt it wasn't challenging enough, that actually it was too rigid, it was too structured, and actually there wasn't an awful lot that he could learn. So, and I think he's not alone. You know, actually most 16 year olds will be very, very competent, but they're not being challenged enough or stimulated in terms of the curriculum offer. Poor old Michael Go. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Can I? We. I'll do one more before oh, you go. Right. You go PG, angry. You have a word as well. Um, we're we're talking about the curriculum and the qualification, but I think it's also important to think about the wider uh, landscape. And that I we can't think of it as a one-off intervention of you can study this in a school and that's it. That's your only exposure to to this. There are so many initiatives now, digital schoolhouse being one, um, that engage young people. So you've got boot camps. You've got Girl Geeks boot camp, uh, which we've supported at, at PlayStation. I'm very proud to. Uh, you've got Coda Dojo. Uh, you've got BAFTA, who are in the room today doing some amazing things through their Young Game Designers program. Now is the best time to be learning around digital coding, programming. This is the best time that I can ever remember to be in this space. So many companies are doing so many things, whether it's Lego, Minecraft, um, the Maker Edition, my, the program I run at Sony. There are so many ways that young people can engage in this. I do think it's important to think beyond just the school curriculum. Absolutely right. Um, would you like to put your hands up? I know there's one at the back. 
Anybody else? I'd like to take two if I can. But if not, we'll go to my old pal, Ty Goddard. My question is, how can we persuade the government that a key component of accelerating our digital skills capacity in this country is actually reinstating uh, that, that kind of intro level, introductory level I, I, IT skills. What can we do practically? I would have thought you'd be ideally placed to talk about this, Monica. I think the, the answer to that lies in harnessing the influence of business um, and um, employers. So we need to get, to get some big businesses and employers on our side to work with us in influencing government. So in Coventry and Warwickshire, for example, um, it's not a gaming industry, it's automotive. You know, there are nearly 20,000 employed in Jaguar Land Rover in, in Coventry and Warwickshire. The thought of JLR not being able to get the skills, the pipeline of skills that they need to sustain their workforce is a big, big persuasive influence on government. So, you know, I think the response is not through um, tackling um, DFE. I think it's about the Department for Business and Industry and Skills and actually getting biz big business players on side with us to do so. Does anyone want to add to this? Um, yeah, I think, I think actually for big business, it's, it's the, the lack of uh, skills doesn't affect us as much as it does the smaller businesses. So in uh, the UK, I think 95% of the 2,000 game studios that exist in this country are small to medium enterprises that um, don't necessarily have the, uh, the financial power to be recruiting globally for, for roles that, that are coming up. So I think big business has a um, responsibility to, um, to youngsters and to, to smaller businesses to keep the industry stimulated and keep the economy stimulated. Marvellous. Right. Uh, I would like to go back to the audience. If there's a, Oh, there's a hand over here, which is great. Is there anyone else who wants to put a hand in the air so we can do two in one go? If um, not... Sorry. Hello. Um, I'm Estelle Ashman. I'm Head of Computer Science at Gildred House in Eastbourne. So we also have a big um, hub of um, digital industry in Brighton, which is obviously not far from us at all. Um, what I wanted to ask is kind of what you were talking about, um, sort of the creativity side of teaching computer science. Um, I worry that because of the move from ICT to computer science, there's a lot of teachers out there, even now, after several years, who are still pretty terrified of teaching computer science. And in, as a result of that, teach it very dryly because they feel they don't really know the content themselves. How do we tackle um, encouraging teachers to be more creative, especially in the secondary um, arena. Did they put the cart before the horse in terms of the qualification before the teacher training? Mary? I'm really glad we did go ahead with the computing curriculum and didn't wait until we had enough teachers to teach it. Um, this has been one of the things we've discussed um, in various different countries and um, they think we're doing a good thing bringing in computing. It was a big risk though and it's still a big challenge. Um, so it's really important that we have places like School House um, and uh, we're running CAS London and um, CAS across the country um, is doing an excellent job. So um, we just need to keep going with that really and um, it's quite tricky because sometimes uh, you get the impression that um, teachers can be trained in the odd course here and there and I think what we need is sustained courses. We tend to run courses that um, go on over a term so there are 10 sessions which are quite chunky after school sessions um, on a weekly basis so that in between teachers have time to practice and we're going to need to keep on doing that. Um, it's not a one-off anyway this development because um, the curriculum needs to keep up to date. It will need to change. We can't um, just stick with, with where we are. So yes, big challenge. Um, and I think lots of people are tackling it across the country. And I think um, that's one of the things I think we're doing quite well in this country com compared with some places. But there's no room for complacency. I mean, I have heard. I mean, I've lost count of the number of teachers who've said to me they're frankly terrified of the, of the computer science curriculum. Um, Navita. Following on from what Mary said about um, sustainability, um, that's definitely key and there are lots of different opportunities available for CPD for teachers across um, 
the area. However, it's also having the time at the ground level to be able to take part in that CPD. And teachers I know of are doing that in their own time, in evenings, during holidays. Um, and as Mary suggested, you know, it's not computer science isn't a subject that's going to stay static. It's something that the CPD needs to continue in. So not only the teachers that haven't had that computer science knowledge from the outset, but even if you do, you still need to continue with that CPD. And I think that's some that's a funding stream that the government needs to make available because schools don't have the budget to allow teachers to have cover and go off on courses and have time to learn these things. And therefore, they are being forced to do it in their own time and it's very time consuming. So the ones that are completely dedicated and really inspired by it all will make that effort, but then you'll have some who just don't have the time to do so. Um, and therefore that is something that still is an issue and that needs to be addressed. I think there's lots of courses out there, but teachers just don't have the time. Anybody want to put their hand up? Uh, yeah, oh, we've got a student, I think. That's what we like to hear. This is the real chalk face. I'd like to ask um, the panel here. Um, I believe that in the future, c computer science will play such a big part of how we live and how we use technology around the world. Um, earlier on, um, you asked about the different types of programming for games and so on. Um, personally, I hadn't heard any of that information and that was completely sprung across me. How do you think that you could help students who are learning computer science like me and like my friend next to me here um, by learning the intricacies of making a game or anything like that due to because I because I've been taught how to code and how to program how do you think you could help by teaching the basics of gaming because let's be honest I'm a boy that likes to play video games on a game console that's what a lot of us are drawn to there's a lot of us in this room, I think. You, um, it sounds perfect for you guys. I was actually going to say, yeah. all right. Um, well, first of all, very cool that you're uh, into this. Um, and it's a good question. So I, I mentioned it before. Now is an awesome time to be doing this, right? So so many companies, uh, included, are reaching out to young people. So best advice, make games. Find people who are as passionate about making games as you are and just surround yourself with those people. And, work, and find out what it means to work as a team, because that's what it is to, to make a game. You're never going to make a game on your own. So work as a team. You're doing that already um, with your friends. And knock on doors. So there are so many resources out there. So you can go to those places I mentioned before, whether it's Coda Dojo or Khan Academy, uh, Digital Schoolhouse. You can download uh, packs from that. Um, Unity is a game engine, which you can move on to in a, in a um, move from scratch to Construct 2. Uh, all these game engines are there which you can use um, as a young person and these companies are willing to to support you uh, get involved with BAFTA so look on BAFTA's website but but my kind of key advice would be don't special don't, don't think about specializing or saying what is the exact thing I need to get this job in 10 years time just have fun now make games find out what you're passionate about because there's so many jobs within games um, I'm sure uh, Peter and I will both say, look, we've come into this industry from very different ways. So there's no one way to get into the industry like, like there is with any job, right? People come into it from so many different angles. But if you're passionate, which we can tell that you are, right? Uh, if you're passionate and you love what you do and you can communicate with people, then that's pretty much the bread and butter. That's what you need. Awesome. Uh, Navita or anyone else, do you want to add something? Oh, Monica. I think the other thing to do is to encourage your school to form partnerships with employers in the digital and gaming sector. So um, in Warwickshire, we run a skills for employment program where we do a sort of a dating thing between big employers and the schools. Um, and we therefore get placements for young people to actually spend time in industry and for teachers to spend time in industry as well. So you get a bit of a flavor for the different options and different types of jobs that are out there. So you know that you're, um, you're building up your um, range of choice and options as to what it is that is gonna be right for you given whatever it is you're passionate about. Um, but ask your school to actually do some buddying with some of the big employers. Fabulous. Um, again, back to the audience if there's a question anywhere 
If oh, here we are. Like the last minute, it's like an auction. <laughs> here I am, a killer question. Uh, I'm, I'm um, desperate to ask. I'm David Yant, and I'm a director of a company called Gfinity, and I've been in the game industry for probably over 20, 25 years. Um, I was a little bit concerned when Monica mentioned about her son uh, dropping out, and then just hearing the comments here is it seems to me there's quite a few young people that are quite inspired, but retaining them it seems to be where it's dropping off. So there's that excitement and fun. How do I stay in there? How, where, where do I go? What do I do? And that, to me, seems a bit of an issue. Is there any comment there? Funny enough, that was pretty much what I was going to ask. I was going to ask, how do you keep up with um, keep up with the kids? You know, speaking on behalf of the teachers, speaking on behalf of the government and the curriculum, speaking on behalf of school leaders um, and people who write exams, a lot of these children, pupils, students are ahead of where we're at. What do you do, Nabita? Um, it's very hard to stay ahead of the students and I don't think I don't think you can pretend when you're standing in front of a class of 16, 17 or even 14 year olds um, to say that you know more than they do and I think it's about being honest with them that you're sometimes learning along with them. Um, it's about ensuring that you have that relationship with them so that you ca they can um, be frank with you about what they're, what inspires them, what their interests are, so that you can ensure that what you're providing for them in the classroom is actually you're facilitating learning for them, and sometimes you're learning with them. Um, it was mentioned before that it's not just about courses and curriculum; it's also what happens outside of that. Um, we as a school do 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 a lot of enrichment activities to ensure that our students are inspired by the other aspects of um, technology and STEM-related careers. So we offer lots of off curriculum day, STEM days. Um, we have partnerships with other schools that we, we that we work with and provide leadership opportunities for our students to enable them to take a lead on something that they're really passionate about. If they want to run a club, whether it be app development or code club or um, web design, that they're able to do that, and they've you know we we give them the facilities to enable them to do that. We mentioned um, partnerships with industry. That's actually an area that we've found really difficult. I don't know about other schools, but Actually, partnering with industry isn't easy. Um, and yes, there are lots of organizations out there that run certain things that we, we do take part in. But actually, making partnerships directly with industry, we've found really hard. Um, we've done very easily with Silicon Valley in San Francisco. And we take our students there every year. And we visit Google and Facebook and Microsoft. And, and we find that that works really well. And those companies open us uh, welcome us with open arms. But here, it doesn't seem to be so um, straightforward or easy and it's not for a lack of trying um, as a computing department we've certainly tried to build links with various industries and employers and, and and it's been few and far between I'm afraid so Luke as the re representative of the entire gaming industry you have to respond let me, let me speak on behalf of the entire industry um, no and I, 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 I can understand it is a challenge sometimes on the flip side um, again I'll, I'll speak on behalf of Peter and, uh, and myself I go to a, a, a lot of events and roundtables, and I'm surrounded by people in the industry who are as passionate as anyone around, around here today about engaging with schools, colleges, universities. So there's, a, there's an appetite on our side, absolutely. And I think linking it back to the question as well, it's, it's trying to think of these not as one-off interventions. So not a, you know, come to our school and give a talk and see you goodbye, which I'm sure not many people do, but, but that can sometimes be a... Um, uh, and if something that happens, but to think about how you engage with, with whether it's an industry employer or a company or an organization beyond just that one off to say, hey, come in and do a talk and then we'll get you back in at such and such. And you can look at these um, briefs that you've set and what students have done with them. And the same with the, the kind of how do you inspire young people? It's I guess it's we need to do a better job of creating this community or ecosystem. So we talk about all the interventions that we do about digital schoolhouse and uh, you can now take apprenticeships in digital areas. Uh, you can go to universities that have been accredited by certain bodies as, as providing good games and degrees. We need to be better at joining those up. So there is this ladder to say, right, you've gone on a digital schoolhouse day. Where do you go to next? Do you go to a boot camp, uh, like a coding boot camp? We need to be better at joining the dots there. And it's, and it's not easy, but, but it's a job that we have to do. Fabulous. I'm going to go to Mary now. I mean, what you're bringing through this next generation of teachers is, is experiencing a completely unique teacher experience, aren't they? Uh, yes and no. Um, 
I mean, I think you're absolutely right. We need to join things up. We need to find ways of actually enabling students who've learned things outside of school to bring those things into school and to link together what they learn in school with what they learn outside of school. And particularly our assessment system, it doesn't really support us very well at the moment. So we need to find ways of um, enabling students to get credits for the skills they've learned outside of school and to link those in with the, with the formal qualifications. Um, I think we also need to remember that um, obviously there are some young, young people like the, the young lad we've heard from here who are really keen already and getting into computing and gaming. But there are a lot of young people who are not necessarily interested in it. Um, we have this myth, which I hate, about digital natives. They're not all digital natives. I mean, they've, they've grown up with um, the technology and so on, and they have expectations. But um, they're not all interested in it. And so there's still a role for teachers to motivate students and to, to get them to be aware of what's going on in the world and how important changes in um, technologies are and um, to develop the kind of understanding they need, even if they don't want to go and be games programmers. So we've got the whole range of um, students that we need to cater for. Oh, well, so I have to warn you, panel, that this is also your final minute, by the way. <laughs> I've just looked at my watch. So thank you very much, Monica. I mean, I, I go back to um, what we were talking about earlier about um, the partnership with it, with industry. So, um, within each area in the country, there's a local enterprise partnership, um, and they are made up of largely private sector businesses who have a, a very well developed of their local understanding of their local economy, and local authorities work with those partnerships to actually um, identify the gaps in the sector and to match the development of skills um, to form that pipeline so that our economies flourish. Um, I think um, young people, um, that's quite right that not all of them are digital natives, um, not all of them do want a career in um, gaming or digital, but actually there's something about making them aware of the different routes that there are to careers in those areas should they want them. So, you know, you don't need to do ICT or computing at A-level to actually get a career in digital or gaming. If you want to go into automotive, you need those uh, digital skills because actually, you know, the, the biggest value um, in automotive development now, the biggest value of a car is in the technology over 50% of the value of a new car is in the technology. And it's engineers and scientists who are developing that technology. Um, so, you know, the curriculum still has, the traditional curriculum still has an awful, an awful lot to offer those kids in terms of a route into industry. And actually broadening the knowledge and the understanding of the wider skills sectors and what is needed from schools, I think, plays a big part in the solution. Marvellous. And the final word, therefore, must go to Peter from Sega. Yeah, I, I think the, I'll just go back to something you were saying earlier. It was, it was something I said right at the beginning about having this standardised approach to um, the industry working together uh, with each other and the digital schoolhouse in order to build um, better partnerships with schools um, and, and ultimately help address this gap. So I think that's why you and I are sitting here today. I think that's why we're all sitting here today and hopefully more and more publishers will come on board, more and more development studios will come on board and we'll be able to lend our expertise to the teaching profession and help bridge that gap eventually, I hope. Well, I think that seems like a really good way of, uh, of summing that up. So I would, all that's left for me is to say thank you very much to our fabulous panel, Vita, Mary, Peter, and uh, say thanks very much to you. Um, I've been Ed, Ed Dorrell. You've been wonderful. Thank you.